All right, for the sake of time, I'm going to have to breeze through some things. Uh, there's some things that, that I'm going to do next week that's going to be a little bit different. Um, second service also today, during worship, we have uh, baptism. So if you know somebody needs to get baptized or you want to get baptized yourself, you're welcome to stay. Uh, we have towels and we have some clothes. Uh, we have toe sacks that we'll give you to wear afterwards. <laughs> some people know what that is. Some people are just like, what is it? Thinking it's a sack for your toe or something. Anyway, I have some important information for you before we continue. <laughs> a middle-aged woman had a heart attack and was taken to the hospital. While on the operating table, she had a near-death experience. Seeing God, she asked, it's my time up. God said, no, you have another 43 years, two months, and eight days to live. Upon hearing this, the woman decided to stay in the hospital and have a facelift, liposuction, and a tummy tuck. She even had someone change her hair color. Since she had so much time to live, she figured might as well make the most of it. She was released from the hospital, but while crossing the street on her way home, she was killed by a car. Arriving in front of God, she demanded, I thought you said I had another 43 years. Why didn't you pull me out of the path of that car? God replied, I didn't recognize you. LAUGHTER Next service, different joke. <laughs> okay, go to 2 Samuel 5.20. 2 Samuel 5.20. How many love the Word? Man, I love the Word. If you, need, if you say, I've never heard God speak to me, open the Bible, read out loud, He's speaking. Hear people say, oh, I just want to hear from God. I just want to hear from God. Do you read the Bible? No, I just want to hear from God. <laughs> Dummy, open the Bible. Anyway. That wasn't nice, was it? <laughs> I heard a, uh, this lady that used to mention, her name's Hetty Lou Brooks. She's as country as she sounds. She has this bouffant hair, and uh, she's probably like 100 now. I don't know how old she is. 85 and still kicking. Anyway, she got on my case more than I can tell you, put her finger in my face. I knew she loved me, but I hated it when she did that. But... Uh, she was, she was teaching one day, and I, listen, I, I was listening to a tape, and she said, I hear the voice of God every single day. And I was like, oh, my God, how do you do that? And she said, I read the Bible. <laughs> You're waiting for this golden nugget, and you get it. It's just like some people want to take the gold nugget, stick it in their pocket instead of spending it and actually doing something with it. But anyway, you're not those people, so let's get on with the word. Second Samuel 5. In verse 20. So David went to Baal Perazim, and David defeated them there. And, and he said, The Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breakthrough of water. Therefore, he called the name of that place, place Baal Perazim. Baal means God of, Perazim means breakthrough. Now, why am I telling you this first? What's it got to do with us as the series we're in on finances or thought life and everything else that I'm talking about? The reason I wanted to tell you that was because I believed uh, last night while I was at the Heidi Baker thing, I just sensed in my heart that we were going to have a time of breakthrough. I sensed in my heart that we're actually, uh, we're not going to do it this week, but next week we're going to have a, uh, a time of impartation of laying on of hands for being broken out of a poverty mindset. Poverty, a poverty mentality is of demonic origin. God never intended any of his children to be poor. He intended them to be rich. Because I wrote down this question before I came out here. I said, and I, I just, who wants every advantage of why Jesus died on the cross? Raise your hand. If, if you want everything that he, you really want everything he died for. What if it means that you're not liked by people? Do you still want it? What if it means that you're actually looked at in disgraceful ways by relatives? Do you still want it? See, Jesus wanted it. He wanted everything the Father had to offer, even to the point where he, his mom and his brothers were outside of a large place that he was, and they were knocking on the door trying to get to him and said, go in and tell Jesus that his mother and his brothers are out here. And Jesus' response was, do you see these people here? These are my mothers. These are my brothers. That's pretty, that's pretty stout if you think about it. But we have to believe what the word says and actually walk out what the word says. And I have scripture after scripture after scripture 
that says God wants us to be prosperous. That he made us, he actually made us for faith, not fear. Made us for prosperity and not poverty. He made us for health and not sickness. If it weren't true, your body wouldn't try to heal yourself when you cut yourself. I don't know how many cuts I have on my hand, you know, how many times I've pulled it. Everybody knows my knife stories, but, you know, and I'll cut myself. And remember, I told you I was on vacation recently, and I cut myself right before going in the salt water. I don't even remember which finger it was. Just, where is she? Oh, she's not here. But it's, it's totally healed. I can't even, I don't even know where it was. I'm a really good healer. Because the DNA of Jesus is in me, so it heals me up really good. Better in stitches. Um, and many of you know what butterfly bandages are. Thank God for butterfly bandages, man. It kept me out of the hospital so many times. My dad, put a butterfly bandage on it, be okay. You know, my dad was not real big. He probably just didn't want to pay the money, but anyway, <laughs> box of band-aids is a whole lot cheaper than uh, going to the doctor. So anyway, but you know, I healed up. I'm still here. But your body is meant to heal itself. It's proof by what your blood does. Your blood rushes to the wound. But it never asks the wound, did you do this to yourself or did somebody else do it? <laughs> Excuse me, I have a question before I get there. Did you do this? And with me, most of the time it was, yeah, I did this to myself. Or did somebody else do it? It's interesting that the blood of Jesus also covers what you do yourself and what other people do to you. But anyway, that was for free. Anyhow, um, so why this scripture? Because in the Hebrew, <coughs> parazim means possessor of the breeches, not the britches, possessor of the breeches. What is a breach? Uh, I want you to just imagine a dam, okay? The, the, what's the big one in Nevada? Hoover, Hoover Dam. If that dam is not maintained and it begins to, it springs a little leak, will the leak fix itself or will it continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger? Okay. I want to look at this opposite. That if, there is, if we've sprung a leak in you where your poverty mentality goes, I don't want you to fix the leak. Because there's a great pressure of water, a great flood behind that leak. And if you'll continue to let it flow, it'll break down the resistance. Does that make sense? I want the dam to come down. I want the damn dam to come down. Because it is. These, you know, <sighs> I get myself into so much crud. Poverty mentality is damnable. Because it's not of God. You know, in movies, the, the worst word that I hate to hear is the word God paired with the word damn. Because not only is, is it blasphemous, not only is it vain, it's impossible. God cannot damn something because damning is not within him. I get a lot of resistance to this, especially when I do stuff on Facebook, talk about a good God in the midst of adverse circumstances. But the truth is he's a good God no matter what the circumstances are. And so we want to break down this wall that keeps the flow of God from coming through our lives. And so if there's a leak in you, let it leak. We're going to chip away at it for a few weeks. Okay? Now, the reason I say that is because next week, we're going to, I think we're going to have some kind of prayer line and that the Lord is going to break. He's going to chip away. He's going to, he's going to break some of that resistance down so that there's a better flow in your lives. How many of you would like to have a better flow of the anointing of God in your life? You know, I, I was, as last night as we were at this thing, I just, you know, I recommitted my life to God. I got saved again. I may have got saved two or three times during this meeting. When you encounter somebody that loves God so much, sometimes you realize, I got a little ways to go. And so I'm young in this. Don't judge me. Judge yourself. But <laughs> I got saved again. And I really, I got on my knees before God and I said, gee whiz, I just got to give you everything. I, I can't hold anything back. I really need to give you everything because... You know, God doesn't, he doesn't come as Lord of some, he comes as Lord of all. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into the word. I want to, so here's, if you stick with me, I believe next week there's going to be a huge breakthrough in finances in your life. And um, so let's, uh, let's go to Ephesians 3.20. I'm going to try to breeze through a few scriptures real quick, okay? Um, and I want to talk to you about thoughts today. 
just for a few minutes as it regards to finances, but you can use it uh, regarding anything in your life. How many of you know the word, the principles of the word go that they can be used for anything? Uh, prosperity secrets don't just work for Christians. Did y'all know that? Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, they give. They're huge benefactors. They give more than a tenth of their income. Um, and I'm going to try to close with the scripture today to, to help solve some things about some people think that tithing is Old Testament. And uh, it, it is Old Testament. It's also New Testament. Yeah, people scream grace and say, well, we're under grace now. We don't have to do that anymore. Well, I, I just encourage you to read what Jesus says about grace in the law. In the law, if you killed somebody, you were guilty. Under grace, if you think bad about somebody, you're guilty. But thank God for grace because it empowers us to do the impossible. Whereas in the old covenant, we had to measure up to the law. Anyway, I, would, I always wonder what I'm going to say when I get up here and then find out there's no end of things to say. So, Ephesians 3.20. Who's there? I love this scripture. It's, uh, it's one of my favorites. There's so much in it. <clears throat> now, I tell you what, let's just... Mm. Back up to 14. For this reason. For what reason? If a scripture starts for this reason, you need to find out what the reason is. And if you go up to verse 12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. I, want you to, I don't want you to lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this reason... I bow my knees to the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. The what of his glory? Riches of his glory. There's another scripture that says um, that God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. You want that to be the source of your supply, not you as your, support, your source, because you'll always run out. The world will always run out. Uh, to be strengthened with might through his spirit and the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, the height to know, which is an action word, not a, just a knowledge word, the love of Christ which passes knowledge. <laughs> Remember your heart can receive what your mind can't understand. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Does the Bible lie? That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. To new, uh, now to him. Okay, so he says all these things. I want you to know the love of God. I want you to be, have the comprehension of God. I want you to know who he is. That you may be full of the fullness of God. Now to him. Who him? Jesus him. Holy Spirit him. To him who is able, and he's the only one that's able, to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that works in us. What is the power that works in us? It's love. That's the power that works within us, that we're supposed to do everything out of. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us you can give everything away to the poor, but if you don't have love, it's worth nothing. We have to have love in our hearts to do what we're called to do. But I want you to notice here, he says, unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all. These words are big. Exceeding, abundantly, above. They're actually, exceeding abundantly is one word, above is another word, and they mean the same thing. The, word, the Greek word is huper, which it's, it kind of means hyper. He is... He gives us hyper above all we could ask or think according to his will. Now you say, I, I'm thinking, Brother Barry, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about so-and-so's wife should be my wife. Listen, I've been around the Word of Faith movement, the charismatic thingy, the, all these different thingies, and I've seen some crazy stuff. I'm 44 years old. <laughs> Praise God, and I'm in the best shape of my life. And I've seen some stuff from when I was young to now. 
God is not going to grant you the desires of your heart if the desires of your heart aren't the desires of his heart. <laughs> so let's just, we'll solve that. But I, actually, I did, I've heard that before. That, you know, somebody who's believing God was in faith for somebody else's wife because they were really supposed to marry him. There was some crazy woman one time believed that uh, Kenneth Copeland was supposed to be her, her wife. And so she started having prayer meetings that Gloria Copeland would die. So that she, oh, don't worry about it. <laughs> She's not dead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, somebody can curse you, pray horrible things over you, but as long as you don't believe it, you're okay. I have a story I want to tell you, but I'm not going to. Because I want to get back to my message. Okay, God wants to do exceedingly abundantly. So he, he's, it's like a more, uh, I've come that you might have life and life more abundantly, more abundantly. Uh, more abundant life in Greek is parisos, which means superior in quality. And overabounding in qual and quantity, it's very similar to this word. And so, if this is the life Jesus wants us to have, why do we have such a problem having it? It's just a question. And I, I, I submit to you, your heart has been transformed. Your spirit is fully mature. It's just getting what's here up here it's an 18 inch journey it's it's sometimes hard now god wants us well off he wants us healthy he wants us uh promoting the kingdom he doesn't want to give us wealth just so we can spend it on ourselves and get a ferrari or whatever it is that we have you know lust of the flesh and stuff like that it doesn't mean however that you can't have enough to get what you want because he does want you happy So nobody wants to be happy. Does anybody, is, Harvey, you need to give me an amen every now and then, man. I just, because I know, I know we're on the same wavelength, brother. Does anybody want to have a better life? Yes. Thank God. I was worried there for a second. I want to reiterate why I'm talking about this. Because I believe we're about to encounter not so many days from now. Those things that can be shaken will be shaken. But the things that can't be shaken and are established in kingdom will not be able to be shaken. That's, that's word, okay? I was talking to a minister friend just the other day. And there is a, a guy that's a financial, he's Holy Spirit financial guy up at Bethel. His name's Stephen De Silva. And he said recently, he believes, and I, I didn't know anything about this, that he believes in the near future, there's going to be another crash in Wall Street. Now, listen, nobody freak out. Don't put your hope in man, put your hope in God, and you'll be okay. Okay, We're called to be a light in the darkness. Okay, So how can a light shine if it's not in the darkness? It's good preaching, Barry. I know, I know, it is. <laughs> I have so many places to go and just not enough time to get there. Let me say that, let me read this to you real quick. Let me just try to put a nail in the coffin of poverty because it should be buried six feet deep and never exhumed. Amen. <clears throat> I was watching, a, I, I like westerns or anything related to a western or anything about a sheriff. And I'm not going to tell you the show I'm watching because I don't want to condone anything in your life that could lead you astray. Anyway, I'm watching this show, and it's a, it's a, you know, it's a cop thing, but it's, um, it's, uh, you know, there's always a mystery and stuff and stuff. You don't tell anybody what I've been watching either. Y'all got to remain to see me holy and unfaulted. <laughs> My wife's belly laughing now. Great. Anyway, anyway, so they needed to prove something in a case, and the proof was in a corpse that had been dead for like, I don't know, three or four years. And so they went out, and they dug up the, uh, the, the coffin, and then they opened it up. And as they're about to open this pine box, they're both looking at each other, you do it. No, you do it. No, you do it. Because they know what's inside is going to be decayed and nasty and smell. 
So he opens it up, and he sees the bottom half, and he's like, oh, oh. And then he opens, and they have to reach into his mouth to get this, this bit of proof. Yeah, I saw some heads just, oh, yeah. Yeah, but if, if that would save your life, you'd do it. If it would keep you out of jail. Anyway, so they do it. They get the evidence. But as they open it up, I look at this. You know, Hollywood's really amazing at how they make things look. And, uh, and it smelled and all that. That's your poverty mentality that you go down and exhume every time that you start thinking God doesn't want you to be well off. You bring that dead corpse up and you start playing with it. It's almost as if you get a, you know, a, one of those baby satchels and you put this corpse on you and you walk around with it. And the whole time, see, you're living, you're reborn, but you've attached a dead thing to you. Well, I got news for you. If you keep dead things around you long enough, you'll start to decay. So everybody say with me, my poverty mentality. I should have said that differently. Does anybody else want to speak the first week I'm gone? (laughs) I've got the mic. I do not have a poverty mentality. mentality. It is dead and buried. buried. And I will not not dig dig it up. What scripture were you going to? <laughs> Numbers 13, 33, don't go there. Let me read it. There was, there we saw, okay, before I read this, let me tell you that uh, Moses was leading the children of Israel and um, he, said, he sent spies out to Canaan land. In Canaan land, there was a lot of ites, Canaanites, Amalekites, other ites. Okay, I don't have time to go into all of it. There's a lot of people in there, and they're all foreigners. Well, actually, Israel was the foreigners. But anyway, they go in there, and he, he says, All right, I'm going to send you out, and I want you to spy it out, see what it looks like, come back, give me a report. Now, 12 of them went. Was it 12 or 10? 12. Who's my scriptorians? It was 12. Yeah, because 10 were dummies and 2 were smart. And so they come back, and they give the report. Now, up until the point in time... They were giving the report. They were okay because they were doing what they were asked to do. Faith is not calling that which is as it is not. See, Christians walking around and they got a cold and I say, you know, are you dealing with the cold? No, I'm healed. (laughs) Jesus name. And I'm like, really? That's awesome. But no, you're not. You're calling what is as though it's not, instead of calling what's not as though it was. There's a big difference. But Satan likes to confuse us and get us doing stupid things. And so, they said, they came back, they gave the report, and this is what they, the end of the report. We, there we saw the Nephilim. Nephilim were giants. They were related to... uh, Goliath, anyway, the sons of Anak, who came from the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Notice the progression of this sentence. We were grasshoppers in our own sight, therefore we were grasshoppers in their sight. You have to know who you are before somebody else is going to know who you are. Now, we believe in the prophetic. We speak encouraging words to people, absolutely. I may see something you don't see in yourself, but you are going to have to realize who you are before other people realize who you are or whose you are. But 10 of them said, we were grasshoppers And then they saw us as grasshoppers. When all actuality, historians say that in the land of Canaan, all those tribes were terrified of Israel because they had heard of the God that split the waters. They had heard of all the stories. And it would have only taken them killing one giant 
for everybody else to flee. And so what would have been an 11-day journey turned into a 40-year trial. How do you see yourself? So if we don't see ourselves as that we actually have an inheritance of salvation. Salvation has three redemptive qualities within it. Eternal security, health in your body, health in your finances. The same blood that was poured out so you could live eternally with the Father is the same blood that was poured out so you could have financial peace. How do you see you is more important than how anyone else sees you. Okay. Now, Proverbs, let me, I'm going to try to cruise through these. Proverbs 23, 5. We have to be willing to have a mind shift. We have to be willing to give up something to receive something. Paul said... I press forward to reach the mark of the prize. I'm not doing it justice, but in other words, I'm pressing forward towards something. I'm pushing forward towards something. I'm I'm grasping after this. But how many of you know you can only grasp so far if you're holding on to something back here? Because as long as you hold on to this, you can only go so far. You can only stretch so much. You have to let go of one mentality to enter into another mentality. And as long as you hold on to this, it's like digging up that dead person. I mean, nobody here in their right mind would go to, let alone a decayed six, I mean, a year decayed person or go to the morgue and start holding a a dead person's hand. Right? Because nobody's really that weird, surely. But... But we hold on to dead ideas as if they're really true. When the truth is, in Deuteronomy 8, 8, 18, it says, It is the Lord my God who has given me the power to get wealth so that I may establish his covenant. So you have to believe. And if I'm, if I'm you know, if I find I made a mistake... As I'm preaching this, I'll tell you I made a mistake. But I'm really trying to find the scripture on this so that you can go and look at it for yourself. Okay? Proverbs 23, 5. You will set your eyes, will you set your eyes upon wealth when suddenly it is gone? See, what you look at, what you behold, you believe. What you behold, you become. If you're always thinking about lack in the checkbook, wondering if you're going to make it, the bills are bigger than the, than the, the whatever, then there's always going to be the struggle that you're in. Let me read the scripture. <clears throat> I'm just going to read a couple more. I'll have to finish the rest next week. Will you set your eyes upon self when suddenly it's gone? For riches certainly make for themselves wings like an eagle that flies toward the heavens. Eat not the bread of him who has a hard, grudging, and envious eye, nor desire his dainty foods. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. As one who reckons, he says to you, eat and drink, yet his heart is not with you, but is grudging the cost. In verse 7, it mentions the heart twice. He thinks in his heart. Now, I can think something here and think something here. And they're contrary. See, I know in my heart that Conrad was to be healed. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, I know it here. But then when someone doesn't get healed, here says, why? What did you do wrong? What did they do wrong? What did the, what the what the what the why the why the why and it never leads me to a good place. 
So what I have to do is revert. I have to do like Jairus. And Jesus says, don't doubt, only believe. And I have to revert back to my heart. It says, God is good all the time. No matter what I see, no matter what I experience, he's good. So, and what doesn't the word say in uh, Romans 10, 9, and 10? With the heart one believes and the mouth confesses to righteousness. Your heart is huge. Your heart is able to take in all the fullness of God and not explode. You can walk in as much anointing in your life as you're willing to give up you to get. You can walk in as much anointing in your life as you're willing to give up you to get. I hear people say, well, I want this, or I'm going to do this, or I want to be in ministry, or I want to have a business. How much of you are you willing to give up to get what you want? For as he thinks in his heart, so is he as one who reckons. He says to you, eat, drink, yet his heart is not with you, but is grudging the cost. I will be transparent with you in this moment. I have been this man. Amy is extremely, I have learned from her to be extremely generous. Where my heart and my head are in alignment with my giving. When it comes to giving to people or helping people or whatever, the tithe was never an issue. It doesn't belong to me. That's a business decision to me. Some people don't like that. Well, this is this church. It's not business. Well, you try to run a church without acting like you're a businessman. Tell me how far you get. Well, we just have love, and love gets us through. <laughs> anyway. It's like people getting married and don't have a plan. Well, we have you love. you. <laughs> Anyway, let me get back to this. <laughs> I love's important, don't get me wrong. But love plans. Love thinks. Love exists in the heart, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So as you think in your heart, you will be. You will draw to yourself the primary and dominant thoughts that you entertain all the time. If you consistently think about failure, you will draw failure to yourself and you will blame God for it if you're a Christian. I see people do it. Well, God must not want me rich because I'm not rich. God didn't want me healed because I got sick. Aunt Minnie died and so it was God's will. No, that's irresponsible theology. And you've made God in your image instead of finding out what the image of God is, which was Jesus. And nobody ever left Jesus sick. God, Barry, you're preaching good. Man, I'm just... I'm just, David encouraged himself because nobody else would sometimes. I'm just saying. Harvey, come on, man. Okay. Now, I'm closing with this. You can have faith in your heart with doubt in your head. It doesn't sound like it makes sense, but it totally does. He just said... He thinks in his heart as one who reckons. He says to you, drink, but his heart's not with you. Has anybody ever received anything from somebody and you knew that they really didn't want to give it to you, but they did it anyway? Yes. Yes. I hope it wasn't me that did it to you. <laughs> <laughs> that was a long time ago. It hasn't been recent. In this last week anyway, so. Okay, you can have faith in your heart even though your head doubts. Mark eleven twenty two. Contrary to popular opinion, Kenneth Hagin did not write this scripture. There's a few people that know what I mean. Kenneth Hagin, his whole ministry was built upon Mark eleven twenty two. He said it so much. Somebody asked him one time, when are you going to stop preaching on Mark 11, 22, 23, and 24? That's kind of how you talk, real nasally. It was pretty good. He said, when you get it. <laughs> Somebody asked Charles Caps one time. You know who Charles Caps is? God, you guys got to go dig into history and get some of these people. You get all this free on YouTube. And get, I mean, people, people say, well, I just don't know where to go. I don't know how to get the word. I just... Shut up. 
get online. Go to Google. Don't believe everything you read, but if it, you know, golly, man, there's just so much available. We live in a, in an, I heard Heidi Baker say this last night. You live in an age where what, half your generation has been killed by abortion, but you still live. This generation of people. More people, more children have been killed in abortion than all the wars combined. Yet you were spared for such a time as this. I want to get political, but I'm not going to. Heard somebody say recently, politics don't belong in church. I do not believe that. Church belongs in politics. Okay, faith in your heart, doubt in your head. Mark 11, 22. Um, So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Or have the God kind of faith. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things which he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Did he say anything about praying in there? All it, it didn't say any the word pray in that scripture. It just said, say, 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 say. Four, four times. I say to you, whoever says doesn't doubt in his heart, but believes those things which he says will come to pass. He will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe you receive them and you'll have them. It was two different scenarios. One, you can say to the mountain, be removed and cast in the sea. If you believe in your heart, don't doubt in your head, it'll come to pass. He just told us, believe in your heart, even though you doubt in your head, and it will come to pass. Some people think if they doubt in their head, they've negated their heart. Or they've, it's like they've, uh, they've crossed out what's going on in their heart, but that's not true. If you believe in your heart, but still doubt up here, it can still come to pass. Because your heart can override your mind. Because mind is influenced by facts, heart is influenced by truth, and truth always trumps fact. Facts change, truth does not. Make sense? And then Proverbs 4.20. Everybody okay? It's good worship this morning. I love it when Trinity sings. Such purity in her voice. Golly. There we go. My son, give attention to my words, incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Why? Because whatever you, be, you behold, you become. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them, and health to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs, spring the issues of life. That's why if something that gets said in church, if it settles in your heart, that it's actually true. And you can find a word that backs it up. Don't, let, don't allow your head to talk you out of the promise of God. So it got back to me last week. Somebody told one of our staff that they, didn't, they actually didn't know that God wanted them to be well off. They thought God wanted them to get by and they wanted them to, to do okay. But not that God wanted them to be wealthy. I hate the word balance. The truth of this is, though, that if your heart motive is not right and you get a lot of money, you won't do good with it. You just won't. That's why it says if you can't be faithful in little things, you're not going to be ruler over much. If, if If I can't be faithful to tithe and give offering as he directs me, then what makes me think he's going to give me true riches, which is not more money, but greater anointing? True riches is not money. It's greater anointing. Wouldn't it be rich that every person, if you you had an anointing in your life that every every person you met that had blindness in an eye, you laid hands on them and they got their sight like that? 
wouldn't that be rich? But even in that favor, you have to have character to undergird it because if you don't, you'll start thinking it's you. That's why God says, if you take care of this little thing, the money thing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pour out so much on you because I know that you can be faithful with the favor that I give you. Amen? Amen. We'll do more next week, and uh, we're going we're gonna to break some things off next week. It's going to be good. So uh, why don't, uh, if prayer teams, come on down. And uh, if, you, um, if you need prayer, if you haven't made Jesus Lord of your life, come up to one of these people. Let them lead you in that. It's the greatest gift that you can ever get. But also if you need healing in your body, if you need agreement for finances, just, uh, just get an agreement. These guys, they don't go, you know, if you want to tell them something, they don't go blurting it to people. They keep it between them and you. And uh, so let's pray as we, uh, as we get ready to go and just let me bless, bless you. Let me, let me say this just real quick. In the Hebrew tradition, when people greet each other, they say, Shalom. Peace be to you. When they exit a conversation or they leave each other's company, they say, Shalom. Go in peace. Now, if you start in peace and you end in peace, everything between it has to be good. Other word, another, and other, otherwise, you negate the peace. That's why our mouths are so important. That our conversation should be upright. It should be pure. That we should be able to greet somebody in peace. And then when we're finished speaking, we can leave them in peace knowing that we did right. So when you talk to these guys, they're going to greet you in peace. And they're going to say farewell in peace. And uh, we're going to get some things done. So, Lord, we love you. We thank you for this day. Lord, I just send everybody out in peace. I speak a blessing of God over them, over their lives, their family, their health, their finances, believing in Jesus' name that you are the giver of all good gifts, that you are teaching us how to be good stewards of your kingdom. We love you and thank you for this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.